to Mark chapter 10, the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the book of Mark chapter 10, the second gospel found in the New Testament, second book of the New Testament. And when you found Mark chapter 10, I wonder tonight if you'd be so kind as to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. We always stand to honor and reverence the reading of God's Word. Amen. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. And the Word of the Lord reads in this fashion. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, speaking of Jesus, and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Well, who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Amen. Matthew chapter 10. Verses 17 through 27. Master, we love you tonight. We thank you, God, for your word. For your word is elevated above all else this hour. And in every service, God, it's not important whether we have a choir. It's not important whether we have a marvelous uh, musical program. But what is important above all else is that the word of God be pure and true. And that it go out with a prophetic voice. God, you've given me a word for this hour, and I ask you, Lord, to help me to preach it, that every soul that hears this message, both here and by tape, God, that they'll be blessed, that they'll be loosed from their burden, God, that they will be delivered from their deception in the name of Jesus Christ, that they might go forth in a saving knowledge of you and you alone. For, Master, we ask it tonight in the wonderful, lovely, saving name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. You know, many love to preach the evils of wealth and extravagant living. Using the scripture that we've used tonight as our primary text. And yet, so few it seems, seem to really see the real message that's being sent by the Lord in this particular passage of scripture for you see tonight the real the real lesson and the real moral in this experience that Jesus Christ had with the young man that we have come to know as the rich young ruler really lies within the last verse in which Jesus says what with men it is impossible but not with God for with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. What Jesus Christ was really saying, MJ, on that day, in a nutshell, what he was saying, it's very easy. 
He was saying there's an exception to every rule. Amen. He said, you see, I've just told you that it's as hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God as it is for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle. Now, a lot of people, when they hear that saying, they mistakenly think that it means a camel going through the little hole at the top of the head of a needle that you sew with. That is not what Jesus was saying. That's not what he meant. Not that what he meant was any easier, <laughs> but it wasn't quite that difficult. You see, in biblical times, all the great cities had walls around them to protect the people from marauders and intruders and what have you. And the walls would be shut up at night so that thieves and those could not come in and out. You know, nobody could invade them and, and take advantage of the people. But what they would do is they would shut the city up tight. But every once in a while, you'd have a merchant that was coming through town, and he would come to the area, but he would come after the city was all shut up for the night. And they would not take a chance on opening the city up for this merchant to enter or this traveler to enter lest he be serving only as a front for a bunch of thieves or an invading body of men that might be short, a short way behind him. So what they did is they had a very small entrance way that would be roughly the size of this area right here in the pulpit, right here, about, about as big as this, to be honest with you. And this little hole existed in the wall going outside the city, and they could open that little hole up to allow the merchant or the traveler to come in, and what they called that little hole was the eye of the needle. You see... And the traveler could basically get on his belly and crawl in. But now if he had a camel that was packed with a bunch of goods and he had a lot of stuff with him, think about it. It's going to be awful difficult for a camel to crawl through the eye of that needle, isn't it? Of course it is. Chances are that a rich man or a uh, traveler who had a lot of goods he would either have to leave his goods outside and get his camel down on its knees and somehow cajole it through the needle on its knees, stripped of all its goods, or he might have to tie his beast up outside until morning when the city was reopened and he could go out and get it. But what Jesus was trying to say that day was to those men that were with him, he said, inasmuch as it is nearly impossible for a camel all loaded up with a bunch of goods to come through the eye of the needle, it's just as hard for a rich man to come into the kingdom of God. And all preachers love, and it cracks me up because half the preachers that love to use this are rich themselves. But preachers love to use this story in the scriptures as an example of how well then exorbitant living are going to bar people from the kingdom of God. Some preachers spend more time trying to figure out who's not going to make it into heaven than they do trying to help people find out how to get in there. Amen. More preachers spend more time preaching about who's not getting into heaven than they do who is. And I'm glad tonight that God has given me the job of preaching the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ so that I'm not concerned about barring anybody from the gates of glory. I'm not concerned tonight about keeping anybody out of God's kingdom, but rather it's my responsibility, it's my job to preach the good news that Jesus Christ has thrown wide open the gates of glory and all that would are able to enter in tonight and be saved. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But the disciples were listening to Jesus and they said, Well, my Lord, if it's that hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God, he said, then who in the world, how are any of us going to be saved? If it's that hard for them, then how about us poor folks? How about us folks that don't have anything? You see, they were missing the entire point from the get-go. 
which was often the case. The real message that Jesus had that day was that with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. In other words, there is an exception tonight to every rule, and that is the title of the message I preached to you this evening, an exception to every rule. In Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 18, the Apostle Paul wrote, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he, meaning God, mercy, on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. You see, as I mentioned a few moments ago, some people are so busy spending all their time trying to figure out who's going to lose out with God and who's going to wind up in hell and who is not going to be saved. And what Paul was saying was that although there is no sin with God, there is no unrighteousness with God, God still in the end reserves the right to judge a righteous judgment. And when it's all said and done, it's not up to the runner, it's not up to the judge, it's up to the one who has the power to say yea or nay. And God alone has the power to say yea or nay. And God alone is able to have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. He alone is able to love whom he will love. He alone is able to receive whomever he will receive. And tonight, my friend, that's good news for everybody in this room. And that's good news for everybody hearing this message by tape. Because God reserves the right to love you. He reserves the right to receive you. He reserves the right to welcome you into his family, into his fellowship, and into his kingdom. Hallelujah. There's an exception to every rule. It seems to the apostles that a rich man could not possibly be saved based on the words of the Lord Jesus. And yet Jesus said, Oh no, he said, what's impossible with man is still possible with God. Hallelujah. Don't you know tonight, MJ, there's some folks out there. <laughs> Woo, I'm going to get happy tonight. I feel good. I'm going to get a little happy. And they just love to preach, you know, the homosexuals and transgendered people, and people they don't understand, and people they don't agree with, and people they're not even trying to get a grasp of where they're coming from and who they are. They love to come out and preach tonight that all those people are headed for a devil's hell. They're headed for an eternity in the company of Satan himself because after all the Bible said, the Bible said, the Bible said, and yet what they do not understand is that God has reserved judgment this hour and he has declared, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Glory to God. Amen. Woo! That's exciting. And you know why I'm here tonight? I'm here tonight because I believe the book more than they do. Hallelujah. I believe the promise of God more than they do. While they're standing upon the letter of the law, I am walking in the spirit of the law. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So let them judge, let them condemn. But my friend, when God turns the table and condemns the condemner, oh my word, and welcomes those condemned, don't turn to me with tears in your eyes, begging for another chance at heaven. Because my friend, if you believe the Bible, if you believe the word of God, if you believe the teachings of Jesus Christ, You'd have understood that he said, Judge not, lest you be judged. 
for the same measure that you judge with. You will one day stand before the throne of God and be judged by that same harsh, ungiving standard. Amen. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Amen. I don't care if it's a local church congregation. I don't care if it's a local pastor. I don't care if it's a denomination. Or tonight if it's a, an organization. If they would dare to dethrone the God of all glory and sit upon His throne in His stead and declare condemnation to any soul, then they are where they do not belong and they stand on dangerous ground. Amen. Because we have no right to judge nor condemn. That's not our job. God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. Amen. Even Pharaoh, the Bible tells us in the passage of Scripture I just quoted to you a few moments ago. Even God raised up Pharaoh with his hard heart to serve his purpose. You know, there are things in your and my life today that we don't understand and we, if, you know, it makes life a whole lot easier if I wasn't like this or if I wasn't like that or if I didn't have this personality trait or if I didn't have this orientation. Uh, things in life would be a whole lot easier. But don't you know today, if God raised up Pharaoh to serve his purpose at that time in history, that his power and his glory might be revealed, then my friend, can we not accept tonight that God has raised you up in your present circumstance and in your situation so that in your life God can show himself powerful. God can show himself merciful. God can show himself gracious and loving and full of compassion. Hallelujah. Whoo! Now tell me that ain't good news. Amen. I know tonight I'm preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Self-righteous religious swords love to identify those who will be lost as though such an exercise were an occasion for joy rather than a cause for mourning. It kills me when a preacher can get up in the pulpit and preach people into hell and preach people into a state of guilt and condemnation and the people and the preacher can shout in the aisles and get happy because they're celebrating the loss of souls and they're celebrating the condemnation of human beings. And where in the name of God is the love of God in that spirit? Amen. It's nowhere. Because my Bible tells me God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come under repentance. I've got news for you children. God's angels, the Bible said, do not rejoice when somebody slides into the torments of hell, but it says instead that the angels of God rejoice every time a sinner repents. Hallelujah! And if churches would preach good old time religion and get back to repentance, get back to faith, Get back to believe in God and obey in this great apostolic gospel. Then there would be cause for rejoicing in the church of God tonight. Hallelujah. Whew. Second Corinthians 3, 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul declares, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You see, those tonight who claim 
to be preaching a New Testament gospel, a New Testament message. They need to understand that the New Testament message is built upon an experience of the baptism and the outpouring and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is not a taker of life. The Holy Ghost is the giver of life. Hallelujah. And when you spend all your time searching through the book, trying to find words of condemnation for this group or that group or for this individual or for that individual or for this kind of people or for that kind of people, then children, you have become an agent of death. Because you're trying desperately to interpret the letter of the law, which Paul himself acknowledged is a killer. It's a destroyer. It's a destructive force. He said, but as ministers of the New Testament, that is not how we operate. But rather now today, we operate in the Spirit of Almighty God. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of God is a life giver, not a life taker. Glory to God. There are people all over this country tonight receiving the Holy Ghost. That some fool in some church doesn't think ought to be receiving the Holy Ghost because of who they are, because of their sexual orientation, because of the color of their skin, because of their heritage, because of their background, because what they do for a living. But I've got news for you children. God is still God. Hallelujah. And he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. What man sees tonight in the letter of the law as impossible, God sees in the law of his spirit as possible. The letter of the law was meant to identify our sinful state. It was meant to help us recognize that we were dead in sin and in need of a Savior. But the spirit the very invisible presence of a resurrected Christ tonight. On the other hand, it's come that we might have new life in Jesus Christ by His own resurrection power. Hallelujah to God. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, verses 9 through 14, Paul writes, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You see, MJ, God gives us the Holy Ghost for a reason. It ain't so you can talk in tongues. That's not the reason the Holy Ghost comes. The Holy Ghost comes because that becomes the seal of our inheritance. The Apostle Paul said it becomes the earnest of our inheritance. And the term earnest that Paul uses here is the same term that we use today when someone goes to buy a large costly possession. You know, if you go to buy a house, you don't go around carrying $200,000 cash money in your pocket. At least most people don't. Right? So when you sign a contract and you make an offer on a house, in order to show those people that you seriously want that house, 
and that this offer is for real, and you're not kidding, you're not joking, you want that house, you put up what is called earnest money. Don't you, Mr. Mortgage Man, huh? You put up earnest money, and that earnest money lets the seller know that the buyer is sincere, and that if the terms are agreed upon, that the buyer will return to take possession of his purchased property. And Jesus Christ gives us the Holy Ghost as earnest. It's the down payment on our redemption. Hallelujah. It's the down payment. It's God saying, I'm serious about saving your soul. I'm serious about ushering you into the kingdom of God. I'm serious about welcoming you into the golden gates of glory. And I'm giving you my Holy Ghost as an earnest payment, as a down payment. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what the Holy Ghost is all about. The Bible said that if the same Spirit that dwelled in Christ dwell also in you, that that same Spirit will raise you up at the time of the resurrection in the same fashion as it raised up Christ Jesus. But think about it. If that be true, then obviously the opposite is also true. If that spirit does not dwell in you, then obviously at the resurrection you will not be getting up. Amen. At the resurrection of the saints, you will not be coming out of your grave. Because you have not been sealed, as Paul said, unto the day of redemption. You have not received the earnest of your inheritance. That's why we Pentecostals believe in receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And speaking with other tongues is merely an evidence or a physical sign that you have indeed received God's great supernatural gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost tonight is not given to believers as an agent of perfection but rather it is given as a security toward that promised day of our perfecting. Throughout biblical history, there have been those who were branded by the law as hopeless without God, doomed. And even today, there are those whom the church universally has branded as evil, ungodly, unholy, and condemned. And tonight, as I wind up, I want to give you some quick examples of some of these hopeless cases that we read about in Scripture. Those whom the letter of the law said were condemned, but the Spirit of the law embodied in the man Jesus Christ, whom He was able to declare, All is well, you're forgiven, go and sin no more. In John chapter 4, verses 1 through 29, we read the story of the woman at the well. She had so many things working against her, she didn't know what to do with herself. First of all, she was a woman. Secondly of all, she was divorced many times. And now she was living with a man without even being married. And thirdly of all, she was a Samaritan. She was outside the loop. The, the Jewish people looked upon her as an outcast and as a, a filthy dog that they would have nothing to do with because she was not one of them. And they believed that not only was salvation of the Jews, but salvation was for the Jews. See, that's the mistake the Jewish people made. They thought that salvation was of the Jews, that it would come through the Jews, but they believed it also was coming for, exclusively for, the Jewish people. But when Jesus met that little woman at the well, and we talked about it recently, He broke down all the stereotypes. He broke down all the barriers. He broke down all the borders. And instead, He opened up the well of, of salvation to her. And He opened up a conversation with her. And He began a dialogue with her and let her know that she too had access to the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God was not tied up in the Hebrew lineage. It was not tied up in 
the Jewish bloodline. Worshiping God was not tied up in whether or not you were in Jerusalem or somewhere else or Mecca. But glory to God, he let her know that God is a spirit. And when it's all said and done, this whole gospel is going to come down to a Holy Ghost experience that anybody can have that wants it. And dare the devil to try to hinder a hungry heart from receiving from God that which he has promised. We have in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, the example tonight of the Ethiopian eunuch. According to the letter of the law, this man was lost. He was without hope. His body had been mutilated in ways that the law said no man of, of this nature could enter into the, the temple of God at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And yet this little man, bless his heart, he still loved God, regardless of what the letter of the law said, he still loved God. He's going to try to do whatever he can. You know, I tell people, if the church tells you you can't, then do whatever you can. Hallelujah. If they say you can't get in, then hallelujah, worship on the outside. But whatever you've got to do, don't let them keep you out altogether. This uh, eunuch made his way to Jerusalem, and he may have said in his heart, they won't allow me in the temple because of who I am, but I'll stand outside the western wall and I'll cry out to God with a sincere and pure heart. And I believe that God will hear and honor my prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, if God would just give us more people tonight that had a mindset like this, like this eunuch. The letter of the law may condemn me, but the spirit of the law says, Come on in, there's still room in the family. Lastly, tonight in Acts chapter 10, we read the story of Cornelius, a devout Gentile man, who was instructed by the Spirit of God to send for a man named Peter. And Peter would come and preach to Cornelius' house the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when it was all said and done, Peter led them in the sinner's prayer. No, he didn't. It's not what it says. Show me one verse in the Bible where anybody ever leads anybody in a sinner's prayer. It's not in the Bible. That's a false doctrine. It's a bunch of garbage, and you need to throw it away. I'll tell you what it says. It said, and while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard them. Hallelujah. While Peter was still preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, those that heard the message were so excited and so thrilled to know that God had not only come to earth and revealed himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and died on the cross of Calvary and rose again by the third day by his own resurrection power, but now he was invisibly present in the world to fill the hearts and lives of every believer. Hearing this news, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, sitting there listening to Peter preach. And how did Peter and the others know that they received the gift of the Holy Ghost? I'll tell you how they knew. The same way we know today that someone has received the gift of the Holy Ghost, because they heard them speak with tongues. And all of a sudden, Peter and the other Jews who had traveled with him stepped back and said, Well, wait a minute. We thought salvation was of the Jews, and we thought salvation was for the Jews. What in the world is God doing? These are Gentiles. These people are unclean to us. These people, we traditionally have had no dealings with the Gentiles. What is God doing? And suddenly God spoke to Peter's spirit and helped him to remember the vision and the dream that he had had earlier. 
as he was up on the rooftop praying. And God said, That which I have called clean, thou shalt in no wise call unclean or common. And suddenly Peter remembered that lesson. And he said, You know what? Where is there some water around here that we shouldn't baptize these men in Jesus' name who have received the Holy Ghost just the same way we did? He said, Honey, if they're good enough for God, they're good enough for me. Let's get them baptized into the church. Hallelujah. But these people were considered hopeless cases. These people were considered out of the loop. Nobody held out any hope for their salvation. But God has declared, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Amen. Have you come to believe tonight that you are hopelessly lost? Has somebody convinced you that you cannot possibly be saved because of who you are or where you come from? Then children, if that be the case, listen to me and learn this truth today. There is an exception to every rule. You can be that very exception if only tonight you will believe this wonderful good news, this great gospel, and obey its call and be saved. Amen. Praise God and amen. There's an exception to every rule that seems impossible to to us is not even remotely impossible to God. Just because somebody thinks that in man's eyes it's impossible for a homosexual or a transgendered individual or a lesbian to be saved, I got news for you children. What's impossible to man is not impossible to God. Amen? Amen. If we'll have faith and walk in faith, God honors faith. And we're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nobody's going to be in heaven and say, I got here because I was able to become straight. Amen. Nobody's going to stand in God's heaven and say, well, I was able to change my sexual orientation, and that's how I got into heaven. Children, you won't get into heaven but by the grace of God through faith in His name. Amen. There is no other way. Praise God. There is no other way. Would you stand with me tonight? Whew. Whew. My Lord, have mercy. We did a little bit of preaching tonight, didn't we? Amen. I have a feeling that this tape in particular is going to be a great help to a lot of people. I hope it is. I trust it is. And that we're going to try and get it out in the mail to as many as we can as soon as possible. King Jesus, we love you. And we thank you, God, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, God, for the encouragement, the enlightenment, the inspiration that your word affords us. Lord, tonight there are so many that are missing from this place who could be here. And God, we're asking you once again, Lord, we're going to keep beating on that door until finally, like the unjust judge, you open up the door and give us the desire of our hearts. And Master, tonight once again we put out on the table our need and our desire, God, that you would send us souls who want to do a work for you. Lord, that we might be a soul-winning church, that we might be a church where the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ is being uh, seen every day, Lord, being poured out upon broken hearts and broken bodies, healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead, delivering from demons this hour. Oh, God, tonight in the name of Jesus, we just ask you, Lord, send us workers, God, send us those who desire to go into the field of labor out of love for this gospel and share the good news with others who need to know. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Master, tonight, in the name of Jesus, just bless this message in a special way. Let every heart that hears it, every ear that's privy to it, God, let them be touched and let them be moved. 
Help them to find a place of restoration in the kingdom and fellowship of our God. And master every demon spirit from hell that would come against the mind of each and every one that would hear this message. In the name of Christ Jesus, I bind it upon the authority of God's word. And I cast it forth as dung. Satan, you're a liar and the father of lies. And we bind you up this moment. And we claim liberty and victory in the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Lord, save the lost. Give us the courage tonight to obey your gospel that we might be saved. For we ask it, O oh God, in the precious, wonderful, lovely, saving name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And amen. Praise God.